Okay, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. Um, we broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today, and it will be available for you to watch later at your convenience on our website. And I will show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of the show recordings. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch, so please share uh, with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, whoever you think might be interested in any of the shows we have on Encompass Live. Uh, for those of you who might be here um, not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries, so similar to your state library. So we provide services and training and resources and grants. Um, to all types of libraries in the state. So you'll find shows on Encompass Live for all types of libraries, public, academic, K-12, um, corrections, museums, archives. Really our only criteria is that something to do with libraries. Uh, something cool libraries are doing, something we think they could be doing. We do book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, all sorts of things. Um, we sometimes bring in guest speakers um, from across Nebraska, from across the country, actually. Um, but we also have Nebraska Library Commission staff that come on and do presentations for us. And that is what we have today. Uh, joining us this morning is Andrew Sherman. Sherm. Good morning, Sherm. Hi. And he is here in our um, at the Library Commission in our Library Development Department, in my department, um, uh, one of our IT people. Our computer gurus, experts, go to them for anything you need to know computer-wise. <laughs> and uh, many of you in Nebraska, I'm sure, have met uh, Sherm as he's been traveling around the state uh, helping libraries get up to date on filtering and networking and computers and anything um, computer-related. Uh, and he's going to talk today about uh, what you should be doing when you are purchasing new computers for your library, because it can be difficult, confusing, you're not sure what you're getting. Uh, you might not know a lot about computers. I know I don't. I trust other people to, for my own personal computers to say, what do I need to do? Yes, build me a computer that will do that. <laughs> um, so I'll just hand it over to you, Sharon, to tell us all about the, what we need to know for purchasing, com purchasing computers for a library. Thanks, Krista. Um, what prompted this is I've been out, as Krista said, visiting libraries under our uh, Medic grant funds where we've been upgrading the networking and putting the deep freeze uh, reboot restore software on public use computers. And unfortunately what we run to, one of the things I check when I do a technology review is to see if the computers are ready for Windows 11, which we'll get to in a little bit. And unfortunately we discovered some libraries that have bought computers in the last year or two, only to find out that the computers they thought were new were actually old and we're not going to be able to run Windows 11, um, which was disappointing. They had spent the money and, and then in a year from now, those computers are gonna be obsolete because some of the limitations on them. So I suggested to Krista, we should maybe do a program. A um, Little bit of a deep dive on what features and options to look for when you're purchasing computers for the library. And we're gonna kind of talk about both the public computers and your staff computers too. So without any further ado, we will get into that. So why are we buying new computers now? Um, as I mentioned before, so if you're still running Windows 7 computers or 8 computers, they're end of life and had been for some time and should have definitely either been upgraded to Windows 10 or replaced. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, Microsoft has announced that Windows 10 is going to be EOL um, end of life in October of next year. Uh, what end of life means is that the, the manufacturer or the developer is discontinuing support for that version of their hardware or software. And the bad thing is, is that means that they're not going to be doing any more security updates, let alone bug fixes and stuff. And so if there's any vulnerabilities to what that version has or some new vulnerabilities that crop up, um, there's going to be no fix for them. So the rule in IT is once a product is end of life or some, some developers will call it end of life and then maybe a few months or up to a year after they'll have what they call EOS, end of support. 
-hmm. then that's where they'll actually say, okay, we're not doing anything for this anymore. Um, it's it needs to be replaced and upgraded to stay secure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this end of life thing, this is coming from Microsoft. This itself. is coming from Microsoft. Yeah, now there is there is a chance. Sort of, yeah, every time person that might help you out, but at some point they're not going to be able to do anything for you. And if you got those Windows 7 and 8 computers still running, way to go, but wow. <laughs> I yeah. Mean, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, they're still even, you know, struggling along, but we hear it, yeah. Yeah, and so it's possible Microsoft could get enough pushback that they may push that date back. They have done it in the past, not mm -hmm. with any track record. Sometimes they stuck to their guns and sometimes they've moved it. This time their new scheme is if you want to continue on those one windows 10 you'll have to pay us to continue to provide updates to you so they're putting kind of a financial stake in the ground says okay if we have to keep supporting you then you're going to have to pay us a monthly fee to get those updates until you get migrated over so we'll just have to see um, what happens the other reason they're doing this is if you follow it news microsoft has had a lot of security issues so what they've done now is they're getting tired of people kicking the stuffing out of them with their security uh, issues. So they've put a stake in the ground where, all right, we're going to make Windows 11 most secure and we're going to require everybody to migrate to it to take advantage of those security features. Um, the big one that we're seeing with PCs four to five years old of whether or not they have what's called TPM, Trusted Platform Module. This is an encryption security chip that they've started pre-installing on computers that lets you do encryption and other security features on the PC. Um, PCs four to five years old may not have it, or they may have the version 1.2 version of it. Uh, and if, if it's not there or it's version 1.2, it will not meet uh, Windows 11 requirements and the PC cannot be upgraded. What is nice is Microsoft's done a little PC Health Check app. Um, it should probably already be on your computer. If it's not, you can just go to the search bar on your taskbar on your computer, type in PC Health Check. It'll pop up as the app, or you'll get a web link where you can download it and install it. And we have there on our presentation, this little what it'll look like when you run it. You check on the, click the check now, and it will check your computer and say, okay, your computer can run Windows 11, and uh, it will provide the instructions to be able to download the upgrade and upgrade the computer Windows 11 or it'll say it can't and the two reasons it will tell you is a there isn't a TPM chip or it's not 2.0 or your processor is too old. Um, we'll talk about processors in a little bit. Um, generally I'm not sure, remember off the top of my head with AMD processors but with Intel processors I think it has to be gen eight or newer, possibly nine or newer to be supported. But even then it has to have the right performance characteristics too. So we'll be talking about what processors to look for and stuff when you're buying new computers. Um, are you sure you've all heard the AI hype? Um, it's starting to leak into the computer space for oh, portable yeah. PCs. Um, they're starting to ship computers with what we call NPUs, neural processing units. Um, I think it's a lot of hype. They have so little um, AI processing power that I don't know that they really will make a discernible difference. Um, that'll probably much more come into play when Microsoft announces what they're going to bundle into Windows 12, which I'm actually would be taking bets that they're not going to call it Windows 12. They're going to call it Windows AI if the hype huh. for AI continues to be as high as it is. Huh. So the first thing we're going to talk about is PC styles. Um, in the in the biz, we call this the form factor. So this is the case for the exterior the exterior of your computer. And I've got some pictures up there. So we have I have a picture I pulled off Dell's page. It shows what we call the the full tower. Um, this could be a micro mini or an and or an all um, one. There's an all in one. We have what we call a mini tower, mini desktop. We have a micro um, tower, micro desktop. Um, here's an example of HP's micro PC. These are very, very small. They're about the size of a book. Um, mm -hmm. They're made to be um, space saving and energy efficient. 
And then this last mm -hmm. picture here at the bottom is what we call um, a mini PC. Um, some people refer to them as NUX, and you see, um, and there again, it's basically a full-blown PC and just a very little tiny um, case and footprint. And we're seeing a lot of these um, micro mini PCs really starting to take off now. They give you the same kind of power um, in a much smaller space. So you may be asking, you know, why would we buy the, the small form factor or the full form factor PCs? It depends what you're doing with them. So um, full size tower PCs are super popular with the gamers because the components they're using, they're running to their peak and they put out a lot of heat. So mm -hmm. to protect the computer and keep their performance up, they have to have significant cooling. So with that large case, um, you're able to move a lot of air through the system. You're able to install some auxiliary, actually liquid cooling systems to keep your processor and uh, GPU uh, cool. So that's the advantage of those full cases. The small form factors, these kind of half size towers or desktops, again, because of the extra space in them, um, they can do a better job of cooling. When you get to the mini and the micros, um, some of those are even fanless these days where they don't need any airflow to cool. You're generally getting more of a laptop style um, setup inside those without the expense of, you know, the keyboard, the monitor screen, everything that comes to the laptop. So it's basically a little tiny laptop in a little tiny box that makes them very cost effective. Um, they're, they don't make any noise. Um, they tend to be one of the more affordable units too. Um, All-in-one PCs tend to be the cheapest out on the market right now. They really target those towards the consumer. Um, the components are actually built into the monitor. So it looks like just a computer monitor, maybe a little thicker from front to back. And all those computer components are built into it. Um, for libraries, I'm not a fan of the all-in-one PCs to use them for public computers. Um, staff, kind of up to you. Um, the reason I don't like them is public computers is the ports are on the back side, so you got to reach around or over the monitor if you want to plug in like your USB drive, things like that. Um, the headphone jacks tend to be on the bottom, kind of out of, they kind of put everything out of sight. So if you have people coming in using the computers in the library, it's, they don't, I guess they don't mean to hide everything, but they kind of hide everything. Um, they can be harder to repair and upgrade. Um, for example, if you need to, maybe you have some memory go bad or you want to do an upgrade. The all-in-ones, a lot of times you have to completely disassemble them. You have to remove the screen and everything to get to mm -hmm. any of the components, um, which is um, a lot of work. And then the thing I really don't like about them is, I don't know how the kids in your library treat your computers, but in my libraries, they jabbed them with their fingers, they wrote on them with pencils, um, they get, they'd be playing Roblox and, their friend would take them out and they would bang on the monitor. Well, the problem with an all-in-one is if that screen gets damaged because of their cost, the whole thing's a throwaway. So if yeah. you've got, you know, your your PC is a separate unit from the monitor, you can replace the monitor. You may have spares sitting around. You can get them used. Um, you can get them cheap off Amazon. It's much easier to replace the monitor than having to throw the whole PC away. So again, the all-in-ones tend to be your best price, um, but I would not use them in, as the public computers. I would go with something where you have a separate um, case for the PC. Totally makes sense, yeah. Laptop, notebooks, two-in-ones, that's getting to be a pretty diverse space with a lot of variation in design. Um, they, your laptop notebooks tend to run from a 13-inch to a 17-inch screen size. Um, I am, for my laptops, I like to have the large laptop. I don't really tall mine around much. Um, I like to have basically a full size, the 17 inch laptops tend to have the better processors and stuff in them too. So they're a little more high power, not a long battery life. But the other thing I really like about them, if you see this one at the bottom, if you get the large screen laptops, they have a full keyboard on them. I'm mm -hmm. a number pad guy, um, Excel guy, so. To me, that's kind of a big deal. Yes, you can hook up an external mouse and keyboard to your laptops. Um, I do like to carry a wireless mouse with me because I'm not a trackpad fan. Um, yeah, but I, I, hate those. I, I can never get those to work right. Always yeah. have extra mouse. I, I don't mind using the laptop's keyboard, though, if it's got a really good keyboard on it. Um, 
portability and battery, um, they make for a great, if you have a meeting room, rather than buying a PC that sits in there and rarely gets used, um, at my libraries, we like to have a floater laptop that the public could use, the staff could use. Um, when we had somebody in the meeting room, we could set the laptop up for them, they could use it, and then the laptop could come out. Um, what I really enjoyed about having a, a staff floater laptop is when it's that time of year to do inventory. Um, I've been in some libraries where they take a cart out and put a whole shelf onto a cart, roll it back to the desk where the computer's at. I always like to just throw a laptop on my cart and go right out to the shelves and I could just do do my inventory check condition of stuff right at the shelves rather than hauling those, all those books back and forth um, from the front desk. The other really nice thing about having a laptop available is if you lose power at the library, um, this kind of goes where I do network upgrades. I like to put the network equipment on a UPS. Well, the laptop with the battery in it has a built-in UPS. So if your power is going to be out for a half hour, an hour, you can hook your laptop up, put your barcode scanner on it, and you continue to check materials in and out as long as your network has also got the battery back up and is running too. Or if your ILS has an, has an offline feature, you know, you're able to use that. Or if your network is, is down but your laptop is running, just to, here's a little hint for you. What I like to do is just fire up Notepad and then scan library card numbers and barcodes off the books into Notepad. And then when everything comes back up, I can cut and paste from Notepad into my ILS and get caught up really quickly instead of handwriting everything down and then having to, to type it back in. And I'm not a great typer, so if typos are mistakes, you know, there's a little trick for you to use Notepad to get you through when you got a power loss or an internet down, you can't access your ILS. Uh, last one are tablets. Um, these are super popular now too. This kind of fades into that two-in-one category for, for notebooks and laptops too. Um, super portable, long battery life. If you've got little kids in the library, a lot of libraries set these out in the children's section now where the kids can use the iPads. Um, I've done them at my libraries. So we've locked them down to just specific websites and specific apps that the kids mm -hmm. could play on. Um, they were really, really popular. What I did with my tablets and the computer is we had protective covers on them. So if the kids dropped them or knocked them over, it protected them. And then the other thing you need to think about is obviously it's something that could easily be picked up and carried out of the library. And yeah. if you're looking at the micro or the mini PCs, or laptops, that's an issue with those too. They're very easy um, to, to disconnect and swipe. Um, a lot of our small libraries, maybe it's not a concern. I've worked in some larger urban libraries where it was definitely a concern. They do make these cable locks that use a little slot that's built into the, the tablet or the laptop, um, and you can lock them down. So you can see the picture we have there where it just loops through the the leg of a table and plugs into the side of the laptop. Um, these can be purchased with either a combo lock or a key. Uh, it kind of depends what you're doing. So the library where I had a bunch of iPads, we used the key lock because we had to disconnect those every night and take them to an area where we can plug them all in and charge them overnight. Mm -hmm. So it was much easier to use a key than to have to fiddle with the combo locks. That is a combination, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you're using them just to secure like maybe many micro PCs that don't move around, but you don't want them walking out the building, the combo lock might be better because you don't have to worry about misplacing or finding the key. You just have to know what your combo is. You can set all the locks to the same number, and that makes life a little easier when it's just a matter of you want to make sure these things stay put and not walk out of the library. Um, Chromebooks, I know during pandemic, there was a lot of funds available to schools and libraries, um, possibly to purchase Chromebooks. Um, it, it depends on the use. Uh, they are very affordable. Um, they get you to the web, they get things done. Um, I personally, my experience with Chromebooks is they are kind of limited on the applications they use. Um, you pretty much have to have a Google account set up with the login to really get their full use. And then I always had printing issues with them too. It just seemed like um, Chromebooks and printers on the network just didn't seem to want to play nice and would run into a lot of issues with theirs. Um, Apple's really resurged. Um, a lot of people um, have switched from Windows to the Apple's. Uh, so you have the iMacs, which are their full kind of one and all-in-ones. 
Uh, you have their MacBooks, you have their Minis, which are kind of like their micro Mac, where you can have just the little box and not have the big built-in screen and everything. I've seen libraries starting to put those in place. Um, you really depends on your community because the the Apple operating system and the Windows operating system they're both what we call GUIs, graphical interfaces, graphical user interfaces, but they're completely different. So it's really which one the people in your community you're familiar with want to use. Um, at one of my libraries, we got an iMac, put it up, and it just didn't get any use. Everybody used the Windows computers. I know other libraries um, maybe have all iMacs or in just one PC because that's what their um, local schools use or that's just the people in their community, they're, they're Mac fans and that's what they like to use. So that brings me to the, you know, the question to ask is should we have Chromebooks or, or iPads or iMacs? What does the local school use? So if the school is providing, they generally will pick either what tends to be popular schools is either Chromebooks or iPads or MacBooks. And if you're thinking of having something that you want the students to be able to come in to use, you probably want to make available whatever the school district has. That whatever said, they're, whatever they're familiar with, yeah. Yeah, if the school's doing one to one computing, that means that they're providing a device to every student. Maybe you really don't need to worry about having that in the library for the fact that the, the kids come to the library, they're going to be bringing their iPad or their Chromebook with them, and all they care about is getting a Wi-Fi connection at the library so they can use them there. So something to think about if, if you know if you buy the Chromebooks but the kids are bringing in their own, they're probably not going to get any use. So again, it all kind of depends on the situation in your community. The other thing, if you're going to have Chromebooks, um, iPads, MacBooks in the library is they kind of have their own uh, management environment to lock them down and secure them. Um, businesses, it's Chrome Enterprise. If you're a library that's already using Google um, Enterprise or business level accounts, this is kind of an extension of that that allows you to manage these devices. There is a charge for it. Um, Google has what they call Family Link, where you can set up a free parent account that allows you to manage five Chromebook devices for free. And then Apple School Manager is Apple's whole suite that allows you to manage um, Macs. The one gotcha on the Apple School Manager, of course, is they expect you to be running it from a Macintosh computer. So um, what I did at the library where we had um, the iPads we actually bought a used Mac Mini, and that was what all we used it for was just to run the the Apple School Manager app to allow us to uh, manage um, the 10 iPads that we had scattered throughout the library. You can use them to lock them down, open them up, add apps to them, remove apps to it. It makes life a lot easier depending on how many of those devices you have to take care of. So now we're going to kind of get into the purchasing on what to look for. Uh, on your computer. So the computer is made up of several components. Um, we're going to start with what we call the CPU, the central processing unit. And this is a processor that, that drives the computer. So for years and years and years, we've been using uh, what's called an instruction set, the x86. And that is based on the original Intel 8086 chip that the first um, personal computers used. And they've kept that kind of naming standard going forward. Um, that uses what's called the complex instruction set computer. Um, that just basically means this is the, the style of coding that's used to drive this chip. Uh, they're, they're big, big transistors, big chips, lots of transistors. They generate a lot of heat. So if you've had a, a laptop sitting on your lap that you're pushing really hard, um, gaming, watching videos and stuff, you may notice it gets hot. Um, you may hear your PC fan kick on and start running hotter to keep it cool. So those processors generate a lot of heat. Um, for that, you get faster processing. Uh, why they really caught on um, in the early uh, personal computer days is it was much easier for programmers to program on them because of the com complex instruction set did a lot of work for them. Uh, the leader in that market for years and years and years was Intel. And they currently have um, their 14th generation chip is out. 
Um, they have them in different model numbers, or I3, I5, I7, and I9. So your I3 would be your low, lowest performing, most affordable processor. Your I9 would be your highest performance, most expensive processor. So if you're a PC gamer, you're probably running an I7, I9 chip. Um, if you're just general use, probably an I3, I5. Um, I'm a big fan of the uh, i5 model of chip. They're the best price performance chip. Uh, if you're looking at getting the cheapest possible computer, um, the i3, the 13th generation, which is i3, the older generation, you can pick those up for probably about 450 to 500 bucks. You are buying, again, last generation chip, the slowest processor they make to get that low, low price. So it's really, you know, depends on your budget and what you have to spend. I will point out um, Intel, and this is where they've really started to lose market share to AMD. They're for 13th and 14th generation chips. They're high power chips, the i7s and the i9s that were popular with the gamers. They had a lot of, st they're still having stability issues with that. And what I mean by that is, so as the gamers crank up those processors playing their games and they start drawing a lot of voltage, um, the, the PCs would just reboot. Uh, you get the, you know, the blue screen of death that we call it in Windows. They, they mm -hmm. hired people reporting all these issues to them. And unfortunately, they never solved the problem with the 13th gen. They finally figured out what was going on with the 14th generation chip. And they claim they're going to have a fix out this month where you'll have to do what we call a firmware upgrade to the chip where you're gonna write new code to the chip to solve the problem. Uh, this has really eaten their lunch and it's really opened the window for AMD to step up and be a big time competitor against Intel because AMD hasn't had any of these issues. So again, when you're out on one of the PC manufacturers websites, a lot of them offer both of them now. You can pick an Intel chip for your computer, or you can pick an AMD chip um, uh, processor for your computer. Um, AMD used to compete against Intel as our processors aren't as good, but they're cheaper and they use less power, which made them popular uh, for the home computers and for laptops. Now they are rivaling um, Intel in performance. And that's the other problem where Intel's having is their chips have never been very power efficient. So AMD has really come after them on all three fronts now. Their processors are super fast, super power efficient. They don't have the stability issue. They tend to be cheaper. So we've seen more P PC manufacturers really um, start to adopt those processors, especially you'll see them in the laptop uh, space. So AMD just released their Zen 5 9000 series. Don't tell, ask me why they use two different names for their generation of chip, but they do. Um, you'll see them referred to as Zen 5, and you'll see them returned to as the 9000 series. Uh, they call their chip the Ryzen. They have versions 5, 7, and 9. And that just came out in July of 2024. They also have the Zen 4 chips, which is what you'll see on the market right now since the Zen 5s just came out, or their 7000 series is what they call them. And they have that in four models. They have a Ryzen 3, 5, 7, and 9. Just like the Intel i3 through 9 we talked about, your uh, Ryzen 3s will be your cheap, uh, lowest performing chip your Ryzen 9s will be your most expensive, highest performing chip. Uh, right now, kind of like the uh, the i5 is I think the best price performance point, the Ryzen 5 is kind of the best price performance point if you're out looking for computers. You wanna get the best performance for the best balance of price, that's the one to go for. Um, again, their Zen 3 series was super popular. They're still out there. They tend to be very, very affordable for PCs, but there's one got you with the Zen 3 chips, and we'll get into this when we talk about memory, is the current standard for, for memory in computers, uh, the RAM is DDR5, and it has some significant performance advantages over the older DDR4 standard. Um, the Zen 3 chips cannot support DDR5, they support DDR4, so if you buy a Zen 3 chip computer, you're gonna get a really good price, but it's gonna be using the old processor standard, two generation old processor standard, and it's gonna be using the older memory standard too. So you get a really good price, but you're giving up performance and kind of the 
the latest and greatest tech um, to get that. The other place where AMD really shines is if you're familiar with uh, graphic cards, which if you're a gamer, PC gamer and stuff, these really come into play, is AMD has integrated their their top selling line of GPUs, graphic processing units with their processor. So if you buy an AMD processor, um, if you spend a little more money, you can get one of their really good graphic processors bundled in with it. They call their lines the Radeon. So when you're out looking at computers, um, you may see an AMD processor and they'll really tout that it has the Radeon graphics that go with it. And what AMD has done is they've got those two processors in their CPU module. So not only do you get a good, a good, get a good computer processor, you get a really good graphics processor as part of the package too, which is another area that gives them a leg up on Intel. So the other thing that's really come along in computer processors, so we talked about the x86, the other competing chip standard that's been out there for years is called ARM, Advanced Risk Machine. It's a reduced instruction set computer. So the difference between the two processors is ARM processors are smaller. They have less transistors. Uh, they run at a lot cooling operating temperature because they have less transistors. So they're super popular in small devices, anything handheld, um, your phones, that's where they've been dominant, or phones and tablets, because they're, they're, they're very low power efficient, and they're very low heat. Um, mm -hmm. The problem with them is you have to do a lot more programming to make them work. They don't have the complex instruction set that the Intels and AMDs have, so the programmer has to do a lot more hardware level programming. So the more sophisticated your device is, a lot, bit, lot, it's a lot more work to program for them, and that's why you've seen that. So for personal computers, it's been x86. For small handheld devices like phones, and then later on tablets, it's been ARM processors. Um, Apple used to use Intel processors, and they made the switch to their own ARM processors. So they're using the same processor in their big iMacs that they're using in their MacBooks. It saves them a lot of development costs. It saves them a lot of manufacturing costs that those processors are now rivaling the x86s in performance. And then they have, so they have the M2 through M4, you'll see in their Macs, and the A4 through the A16 in their iPhones and iPads. And by using ARM across their entire product line, their software can literally, it's completely compatible between the platforms. Obviously you can't do on a phone what you could do on a Mac, but it really saves them a lot of money and makes their programming efforts really efficient. Uh, Microsoft has tried some ARM processors in the past, and they've done really, really badly with them. Uh, they tried to come out with an ARM processor that could run Windows. Um, instead of actually rewriting the Windows operating system to natively support the ARM processor, they tried to throw a software emulator into the mix. They were horrible, they were slow, they're buggy. People were buying them, assuming, well, it's a Windows box, I can run Office. They never made Office compatible with them, so they were a disaster. They've done it twice, I don't know why. Well, they finally now have adopted a new ARM processor called the Snapdragon X Elite, and they've actually written a version of Windows to work best on this ARM processor. They just released them, they're expensive. Uh, it's their new Surface line. The Snapdragon surfaces tend to be, I think they start around 1,300, 1,400 bucks, but they are getting amazing reviews. They said they are, people, the reviewers are saying they're better than any of the hardware Apple has on the hmm. market now. So if hmm. you don't mind the Windows operating system, the reviewers are all saying Apple better watch out because Microsoft's coming <laughs> for them. Uh, they have the record battery life um, for a laptop or a tablet. They're saying they can run games uh, video everything for just hours and hours and hours before they need to be plugged in. And again, this is another thing where Intel is really in the lurch. They kind of ignored the ARM space, uh, didn't invest in it. Now the ARMs have caught up with the x86s and their performance, but they offer significantly better power efficiency. They run a lot cooler, and it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out um, in the market going forward. So those will be your two choices. Um, the ARMs will come into play if you're looking at, generally still just at tablets or very small, what we call ultra portable laptops or notebooks. 
but be aware of that. And right now, I think if I was going to buy, you know, a new tablet, a new ultra portable laptop, um, those Microsoft Surface with the Snapdragons would really get my consideration for a really, really good computer. The other thing on your computers, we cover the CPUs. Now we're going to talk about disk drives. So disk drives, a lot of people, I think, when I talk about the hard disk or the disk drive in the computer, you think about this first picture here. That's the old mechanical drives. They don't really use those anymore. Uh -huh. um, there's an exception we'll talk about. So they're the old magnetic platters. Everybody knows about, um, you know, noisy. You can hear them run. You can hear them click. When they start to go bad, you'll hear them grind or buzz. And they use a, a bus technology. That's technology that transfers information from the drive to the processor called SATA. Uh, they've been around for years and years and years. Um, and it was it was what we had for technology. And the reason for that was is they have had attempts to do what we call silicon drives, where instead of using the magnetic platter, it uses a chip. But the problem is those with those chips is after they've had a lot of use, they start to fail. So they were never able to come up with what we call a solid state or chip-based drive that was dependable enough that we would want to use it to store our important stuff like our pictures and our documents on. So those, um, what we call those NAND memory chips were pretty much restricted to just being used in USB drives. I don't know how many people of you have used USB drives. I've used enough over the years, they go bad. Once you read and write enough on them, they just quit working because the chips degrade. So they were considered the kind of a low quality. They don't use a very smart controller. They're made to be very inexpensive and disposable. Well, what happened is those NAND chips got better and better and better over time. And then they came up with some controller technology where when you write to one of those SSD drives, solid state drives, it actually tests that memory to make sure it's still good. And if it's not, it'll mark it bad and put your information somewhere else. So with the advanced controllers and the better ch quality chips, we were able to now step into the solid state drive um, era. So the big advantage these had, especially they got really popular for use in tablets and notebooks because you know, if you had your laptop with one of the old hard disk drives in it and it got banged around too hard, you'd ruin your drive and ruin your day. SSD drives don't have that problem. They can get banged around in your luggage, in your backpack, in your briefcase, and they don't have those um, the vulnerabilities that the old hard disk platter style drives had. Um, so just fantastic durability. They were faster because now you're actually just accessing memory chips. You're not having to wait for that actuator arm to find the right space on the drive and retrieve your data. So they're much faster and they use a lot less power because you're just powering chips. You're not having to matter, power that whole moto, motor, motor and servo unit in the old style drives. So they caught on very quickly. Um, as a gamer on your PCs at home, if you had an older computer and it was time to replace it, you could literally, by buying an SSD drive and a new graphics card, you could keep using your old PC for a long, long time because you got such a performance boost over switching over to an SSD drive and a separate graphics um, GPU. Um, that's maybe not quite the case anymore because the technology is really caught up, but um, you could take an old computer, throw an SSD and a graphics card in it, and you'd think you had a brand new computer. It was so much faster and better. So we've been through several generations of the SSDs. Um, we had the second generation SSD, they called MSATA. So it was a little bit faster bus. Um, again, used less power than the first generation SSDs. Then we had a third generation they called M.2 SATA, which um, again used a faster SATA processing, but then they also switched the bus. Mm -hmm. So your computer um, has a bus called SATA for connecting to two hard disk drives. And then they have a PCI um, bus that can be used for like network cards, graphic cards and stuff. What they started doing now was abandoning the old slow SATA bus. And you can see the, the data transfer rates we have here. So SATA maxed out at moving 600 megabits of data per second. PCIe in the current generation, you can move 
2,000 megabits of data per second. So the current generation, what we call the NVMe SSD drives, and this is what almost all the computers available on the market right now are going to have. They're super, super fast. They use way less power. So again, the portability of laptop market really drove this. Now it's in laptop and desktop PCs. So if you're buying new computers, that fourth gen, in the presentation, I, I wanna note the stuff I have highlighted in yellow, that's kind of the, what you wanna look for if you wanna get the best best value for your spend in the computers. But almost anything you look at now is gonna have that NVMe drive in it, and that's what you want. Uh, the other yeah, way- you're talking, you mentioned about the presentation. If anyone was wondering, you, we will have these slides available to you all afterwards too. So um, there's a lot of good info on here and great, you know, the, the the pictures and stuff of, of everything. You'll all have access to this afterwards to use when you're uh, actually uh, investigating doing your purchasing. So the other way you can save a lot of money is by getting the right size of drive with the computer you purchase. So they do make PCs on the market that have 128 gigabit drive. That's barely big enough to hold Windows. I don't recommend those size of drives. Um, at a minimum, you want to purchase a PC with a 256 gigabit um, drive. Those are perfect for public computers because obviously all we care about is really just the OS and a few of the apps we put on them. 256 gigabytes is plenty of space and you can save some money on the spend by going with that smaller size drive. Um, I wouldn't go any bigger than 512 depending on what you're looking at. Um, that's plenty of space for a public computer. Staff computers, I think you want to start with a, a 512 or half a terabyte drive up to a terabyte drive. That'll give you plenty of room for your um, all the documents, all the pictures and things you store. Um, some manufacturers now are selling computers that are dual drive. So they mm -hmm. have a little 128 megabit SSD drive that the Windows or the operating system lives on for fast boot up, fast performance. And then they have a large HHD drive that's used for storing your documents and pictures and stuff. Um, the reason for that is um, the old hard disk drives are still a more reliable long-term storage platform than the SSD drives. SSDs drives have a, once they've been written, read and written so many times, they start to fail and go bad and have to be replaced. The old HHD technology doesn't have that problem. So some of the man, some of the PFE managers are offering these dual drives. I really don't see a need for them unless you, you know, you're archiving a lot of documents or pictures. Um, mm -hmm. I would just make sure you have a big enough SSD. We all should be backing up our computers anyway. I, I hate having to say that, but you should have a separate external hard drive or US, uh, USB drives aren't really what I would consider a good backup drive. You wanna buy an external SSD drive and that's what you should be backing your stuff up to on a regular basis. So if you have an issue with your PC, you have that all that in a backup drive. So I, I don't know that there's a lot of value to having that dual drive model. Um, I don't know, see that it's really reduces the price of the computer at all either. So it would be up to you, but I, I think I would probably avoid that and just stick with the straight um, SSD drive in the computer I'm purchasing. Uh, the other thing to be aware of is uh, CD, DVD drives, they don't even ship them anymore. They're an extra add-on. They'll put them in there if you want them. They'll charge you extra to have it. Mm -hmm. um, I've been in libraries where we had people that would come in and pull a DVD off the shelf and take it to a public computer and watch the movie in the computer. If you still see that in your libraries, uh, you may want to consider having uh, DVD drives in your public computers. If you see a lot of people still doing that, um, now that we're the streaming generation, um, you know, DVDs are kind of on the way out, uh, but they're still popular at libraries. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I would recommend doing if you want to save some money is instead of putting DVD drives in all your public computers, you can get a cheap external drive for 20 bucks and keep it at the desk. And if somebody brings in a DVD or a CD they need to access, you can check it out to them. They can plug it in, use it, bring it back to the desk and save yourself a little money and hassle by not having those in the computers anymore. Yeah, it's definitely a thing that varies from library to library. I know I've seen on 
on Facebook groups and you know library Facebook groups or message boards and stuff, libraries asking, do you still do DVDs? Do you even circulate them at all? And some people say, oh, absolutely. People are constantly, and some people say, nope, we got rid of the whole collection. <laughs> yeah, and so what's interesting is, deal. I don't know if everybody knows, um, Redbox went out of business. Right. Redbox was owned by, Ch you know, everybody remembers Chicken Soup for the Soul? Yeah. Well, Chicken yeah. Soup for the Soul Enterprises bought Redbox a few years ago. They paid a lot of money for them, and the people blame that purchase for Chicken Soup going bankrupt. And hmm. they didn't go Chapter 11 where they got an investor and they reorganized. They went Chapter 7. They're done and gone. They closed up shop. So the red boxes, if you're is not gone, it's going away. Be, yeah. They want to be prepared for the people that used to use Red Box because they can't afford or don't have the internet to allow them to stream. Maybe hmm. coming in the library saying, "Hey, the red box went away." you guys have dvds so yeah. Yeah. and i know a lot of our small rural communities have the red box sitting outside the gas station and if mm -hmm. you had bad internet service in your community that was the way you watch movies so and we had them here in lincoln there's one that was outside the cvs i remember seeing it there I, when i was in sydney i used the one in sydney a lot just because uh it was a cheap cheap way to watch movies without mm -hmm. paying for a you know a max subscription or showtime and yeah. stuff like that uh, we do a question about backup um, yeah. for, for, um, for backup users that do you recommend the SSD drive backup or or what about cloud storage? So how cloud, do you compare yeah. that Yeah, so cloud? cloud storage is really where it's all gone now. Um, if you use a Windows PC, um, when you set it up, your default storage area is OneDrive. You get a free space with Microsoft. That's all out on the cloud. So... Um, you want to be careful. Um, you may think you're you're storing stuff on your PC, but you're actually storing it on OneDrive. Um, so you want to make sure it's wow. stored somewhere locally and possibly on OneDrive also. Um, the nice thing about OneDrive is if you have a Microsoft account, you can access your OneDrive from any computer by logging into your Microsoft account. But you mm -hmm. want to make sure you have those files duplicated on some type of local media also. Um, yeah, you don't want to just Windows. depend on the cloud because if it ever goes away, yeah. it goes away. <laughs> when you set up your Windows computer, you can turn OneDrive off. If you're not logged into a Microsoft account, OneDrive won't be enabled, so you're storing everything locally to your computer. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, I'm, uh, I use uh, Chrome. Uh, Google's cloud storage for my stuff. I, on my I, iPhone, I pay for the extra storage okay. in iCloud to because um, sometimes I get too lazy to clean up pictures and videos off my phone. It's easier to pay uh, Apple 99 cents a month for a bunch of cloud space than it is to go clean my phone up. So just be aware of where your files are going and make sure you if they're in the cloud, you have a local backup, or if you're storing them locally, the cloud is a great place to have a backup. And if you set up um, if you're using Microsoft 365 for the staff or you're using um, Google Enterprise, that cloud is a great way that if you have your accounts integrated, you're sharing files uh, with your coworkers and stuff through the cloud too, which is really, really nice. Very convenient, yeah. Um, the other big part of PC component is what we call the memory. Um, it used to be RAM, they now call it SDRAM. Um, so the, the memory of your computer, this is what allows the software and the operating system to be loaded up from your drive into the memory of the computer so it runs really, really fast. And we've had, obviously, this has changed over time. So if anybody here, like me, remembers the DOS days, we had mm -hmm. the 640 kilobit limit, which seems crazy. You ran one app at a time. Um, and that was that was how life worked. If you were in WordPerfect, you needed to switch to um, Lotus one two three, your spreadsheet. You had to shut down WordPerfect and then open Lotus and work in that, and then shut it down and switch back. And that was that that was the life. Uh, Windows, when Windows three three finally took over, um, we had 32-bit operating system, which had a four gigabit memory limit, which seemed like all the memory we would ever ever need. Um, and then later on, we had the 64-bit window versions come out, and those support a huge amount of memory. At this point, nobody even probably has that much memory unless you're like 
you know, really high intensity graphics workstation or something, but most people are just fine with uh, eight megabit. So Windows, form, Windows 7, four megabit was the recommended minimum. Windows 8 was a disaster. We don't need to talk about it. Windows 10, 8 mega memory is kind of the recommended minimum. If you're a power user, um, probably 16. For staff computers, you may want to consider 16 megabits of memory. That's the amount of memory you need for. So if you're a gamer, AAA gamer, playing all the big hot games on your PC, you want 16 mega RAM. Photo editing, 16 mega RAM. Video editing, that can... 16 to maybe 32. Uh, if you're doing virtual reality headsets and that, that may be 16 to 32 megabits of memory in those computers also. Um, mm -hmm. What happens is if you don't have enough memory in your computer, um, your computer will do a function called page swapping. So when, what your computer tries to do, okay, I don't have enough memory, they're running too much stuff. I'm gonna look and see if I can figure out which seems to be being used the least and I'm gonna swap that memory out to the hard drive so I can free memory up for the stuff that's actively running. It's a nice little workaround, but the problem is if you're doing a lot of page swapping, you're giving up the speed of that random access memory for the access speed of your hard drive. So when you start page swapping, your PC is gonna really slow down because when you've switched to the app or the browser tab that's been swapped, you have to wait for that to get loaded back into memory from your hard drive and something else is going to get swapped out to make the room for it. So that's where memory plays a big, big role in um, how fast your computer runs. Like I said, back in the day, um, if your computer got slow, you put in an SSD, put in some more RAM, and it was like having a brand new computer because it, it would just solve all your performance issues. Um, but these days, the drives are so fast, the memory, um, everything is so fast now that it's kind of come back to making sure you have enough memory in that computer. Public computers, eight mega memory should be fine. Um, if you, you know, if you get a deal and the 16 is not much more than the eight, you may want to think about going the 16 because of all the AI stuff that's coming. Nobody really knows what the impact of that is going to be yet on memory, so if you have an NPU in your computer, it's gotta use some memory from somewhere, so we'll kinda have to wait and see. So again, talking about memory, there's two types. Um, there's what we call DIMM, and that's that picture, that top picture on the right, that's what your desktop computers use. And then we have what we call SODIMM, which is a smaller format that's more expensive, that's what your laptops, um, notebooks, uh, tablets and stuff use. So it basically does the same thing. It's just a smaller format. And it's more expensive to manufacture, but it takes up a lot less space and that's why they do it. Um, I don't see a lot of people upgrading computer memory anymore. You pretty much know what your computer is going to be used for. Ideally, you want to buy it with the memory it needs. Um, some of the geeks like me the manufacturer may charge more for their memory if you get it bundled. If you know how to do it, you can buy a PC from Dell with the minimum and then go buy your own memory and upgrade it and save a few bucks. Um, for the most part though, the prices have come down enough that that's probably not really worth it anymore. But if you're interested, one of the things you might wanna look at on the specs for the computer you're buying is we'll tell you um, what style of DIMM is in there. So if you wanna buy a PC with eight gigabit of memory, um, the PC could have two four gigabit SIMs that make eight gigabit, or it could have one eight gigabit. Um, for 16 meg gigabits of memory, it may have um, two eights or one 16. Um, for 32, it may have two 16s or 132. It just depends. It really depends on what the manufacturer bought and when and what's the cheapest way for them to get that memory in the computer. Um, the other thing they've cut down on is the number of what we call those DIMM slots in the computers. So four used to be the standard. A lot of manufacturers have cut them down to two. Um, some of your laptops may only have one. So if you have eight gig of RAM and you wanna get to 16 gig of RAM, you have to throw the eight gig chip away and put a 16 gig chip in. Um, the, used to be very particular about the chips had to be identical. The DIMMs had to be identical for them to work. That varies from manufacturer to manufacturer. But at the end of the day, if, 
if you think you know you're going to be doing a little more high powered stuff uh, you're probably better off getting the right amount of memory out of the gate when you buy the computer so public computers eight gig is fine um, staff computers you may want to consider spending a little more money getting the six gig um, this kind of comes back to the all-in-one on the small laptops if you would need to do a memory upgrade they build those PCs so compact and enclosed that you could wind up having to take the whole screen and everything apart or the keyboard off the laptop to be able to do a memory upgrade. So again, better to buy too much memory than too little out of the gate. Yeah. But the one thing you wanna make sure I would say is you wanna buy a computer that has the DDR5, the current standard. Um, I've been out on Dell's and HP's websites. Uh, they have a lot of cheap computers out there that are using DD4. It's not the end of the world, but when you look at the price difference between one of their computers with DDR4 and one of their computers with DDR5, um, I think it's definitely worth making sure that if you look at the tech specs for the computer, that you've got DDR5 memory in it versus the DDR4. I just uh, want to jump in here uh, before going on um, that we are just hitting 11 o'clock um, on uh, here Central Time. Uh, and I know Sherman has quite a few slides left to go through. So um, we will, we're gonna keep going through so you can get through everything that he has for today. Um, so we have the, all, all the information you need. Um, but if you need to take off because you all, attendees, not you Sherman, <laughs> because you only allowed an hour for today's show, that's fine. Um, we'll keep going, we'll be recording the whole thing so you have access to all this information afterwards as well and the full slide deck too. So um, if you need to log off, go ahead. If not, um, stick around with us and we'll um, get through everything that Sherm has to share today. So the the other component we're gonna talk about is video. Um, so for a long, long time, the Intel computers had a what we call graphics processing unit that was built into their processor. Um, the GPU was built into the CPU and they shared the memory and everything. And for just doing basic computer stuff, um, spreadsheets worked, uh, word processing, surfing the web and stuff, that's fine. Uh, when computer gaming really caught on, the gamers want the most realistic, lifelike graphics they can get. So then they brought in what we call, instead of the integrated graphics, that's when the discrete graphics really started to take off, where you installed a graphics card like that one at the top in your computer, didn't use the integrated graphic chip anymore, and so you you got way, way better graphics performance to drive your game and stuff. This used to be a great way to speed up an old computer too, is you could buy a an old generation cheap discrete graphics card, add it to your computer, took all the graphics processing off the CPU, and it used to be a really good way to kind of um, upgrade the performance of an old computer. Um, what some of the manufacturers are doing now is instead of having to pay for a separate graphics card, they're building it into the motherboard. So you may see computers out there that have a graphics chip built in. They're meant to be like affordable gaming computers. Uh, you'll see this a lot in the laptops. So when somebody says it's a gaming quality laptop, it's got a high-end GPU, um, tends to be a miniaturized version that's power efficient. Um, so it's not like the best GPU you can get, but the idea of being able to play all your games on a laptop that you can haul around with you is pretty popular now. Mm -hmm. And that NVIDIA uh, GeForce One right now seems to be the sweet spot for price performance if you're looking at a really nice gaming laptop or if you want gaming laptops in your library for the, if you're having a gaming club or something, that's kind of that sweet spot you want to look at if you're looking to buy a gaming laptop. Uh, for use in the library. Um, Intel, who again got their lunch eaten over the GPU space, has now introduced their own line of discrete graphic chips. They're called ARC. Um, they were, as Intel usually does, they were kind of a disaster when they first came out. But now that they're in the second generation for them, they've gotten a lot better. I don't know if they make any money on them, but they're using them to try and win back share um, against NVIDIA and Radeon for graphics built into the computers. Uh, the monitors, 24-inch uh, is kind of the new standard. Um, a lot of the libraries, I know the older computers kind of used to do 19 inches, what we used to see. Um, you can still get the smaller monitors. They're just a lot harder to find. 24-inch tends to be the sweet spot for the cheap $100 monitor now. 
Um, when you get new computers in your library, if you're happy with the monitors you have, um, there's no need to buy a new monitor. Um, I recommend getting those probably separate from the computer. If you buy a Dell computer monitor combo or an HP computer monitor, you'll probably pay more for the monitor than you should. Um, you can get them cheap off of uh, Amazon. So if you're going to reuse an old monitor, um, you're going to might run into the need for a cable adapter. So if you've got old monitors in your library that only use a VGA plug, or they have maybe the, the, the standard that came after VGA DVI, and your laptop or your desktop PC, now all they have is the HDMI plug, um, you may need to get a little dongle, what we call them, or a little converter cable, so you can still plug the HDMI port from your PC into the VGA port on your monitor. There's nothing wrong with that. It works fine. Um, I do it with my laptop at home. Uh, but the one thing you have to be aware is there's what we call uh, single direction and bi-directional dongles. So um, you can get bi-directional. They tend to cost twice, to two, three times as much as a single direction dongle. So if you're out on Amazon, you're looking, okay, I need to get from an HDMI to a VGA port. If you look at that picture I have there, they will say that they're, they will say HDMI to VGA, which means they can only take video out of an HDMI port and give it to a VGA port. Let's say you've got an old computer that you put a new monitor on, you wanna go from VGA off your old computer to an HDMI, that one directional cable won't work. It can only convert HDI to VGA. So then you probably wouldn't wanna buy a bi-directional cable that can transfer the video in either direction and you, you'll pay you know, 20, 30 bucks for that cable where a single direction cable you'll pay 10 or $15 for. So make sure that if you're getting a video cable adapter, you purchase one that's converting in the right method that you need it to go. Um, they do, like I said, make the bi-directional ones that if you wanna make, don't run and wanna run into that hassle, you can spend more money and get a bi-directional that can be hooked up either way. Uh, for staff, uh, consider getting larger computers or maybe even doing multiple screens for your staff. This is where laptops are really nice because your laptop has a screen built in. You can put a monitor to the side of it, plug it into the HDMI port on your laptop, and you have a dual screen set up, which is really, really nice for working. Um, that's what I do with my laptop at home, and I love it. But again, the standard now is HDMI. Um, gaming laptops uh, may be using something that's called um, the, the DP ports, where they have two different sizes of that. That's a higher performance video uh, cable standard. Um, some of the laptops may have the mini DP ports on them too, but really um, HDMI should be what you're looking for and you'll be fine. Other components, uh, the network connection. Uh, some desktop computers have it built in, some don't. Um, so if, if it does have Wi-Fi built in, and the laptop definitely will, make sure you're getting at least one that supports Wi-Fi 6. That's the standard that you wanna have it supported in a minimum. Um, if you, and that's probably what the Wi-Fi network at your library, if it's been upgraded recently, would support. Um, the upgrades I've been doing for libraries with our Medica grant, we've been targeting 6E. Um, it gives you all the benefits of Wi-Fi 7 at considerably less of a spend. Um, Wi-Fi 7 is the current standard, and you'll see it's got that six gigahertz radio frequency. It makes for super fast network connections. The other thing to be aware of if you're buying laptop, especially if you're getting the small, you know, 11 inch, 13 inch screen laptops, the notebooks or the ultra books, that ethernet port may not even be there anymore. They're dependent on a Wi-Fi connection to work. So I kind of have the picture of the ethernet port there with the red box on it. Um, don't be surprised in the smaller uh, laptops that those aren't even around anymore and it has to have a Wi-Fi network to connect to. Keyboard and mouse. Uh, the other thing I've been seeing a lot is the new computers are now shipping with wireless keyboards and mice. They're not even shipping them with the old wired ones anymore. That's fantastic. I love my wireless keyboard and mouse. I like being able to move it around the desk as I want. Um, the issue with that is, is on the public PCs, I've worked in some large urban libraries 
And I would absolutely not put a wireless mouse and keyboard out for my public computers. Um, the libraries I worked on, um, some of our clientele would be, hey, free keyboard and mouse, or yeah. we can open it up. The batteries are free. I can just take all the AAA, mm -hmm. AA batteries I want home with me. Um, there's a couple other issues. So I don't know if, if anybody here is old enough to remember the old um, mouse computers, that, mouse that had balls in them where they had a little twist ball lock ball. With, yes. with the balls in them <laughs> and people would come to the library or the kids would play with them. They twist the lock off, the ball would fall out and roll off who knows where. And mm -hmm. now your mouse wasn't any good. Um, we're kind of in back in that those days with the wireless mice. So there's a cover for the battery. They tend to come off really easy. Um, so that may disappear on you. Um, the other thing they do is these aren't set up to use like Bluetooth built in the computer. They come with a proprietary um, receiver and you'll see these plugged into one of the USB ports on the new computer. Um, the problem is if somebody takes that receiver, the whole thing doesn't work anymore. Yeah. So let's say I came in the library and I propped down at one of those all-in-one computers and I want to use my USB drive. So I look on the back and I pull that out and plug my USB drive in. Well, now my mouse and keyboard doesn't work. Or, um, yeah, so not a fan of those on the public computers. If you have wired mice and keyboard that still work great and you're replacing existing public computers, I would continue to use the wired keyboards and mice and not put the wireless ones out for the public's use. Uh, we have a question about Wi-Fi, um, yeah. actually. So wants to know where would libraries go to for Wi-Fi infrastructure recommendations? I am so happy to help you. with that. <laughs> so um, as part yeah. of the MECA grant, I've actually been on site helping doing the upgrades for libraries of their networking equipment. We've run into a lot of really old network gear out there, especially the end of life issue where the library is using a switch or a router or a wireless mm -hmm. access point that is 10 years old, has not had security updates on it forever. It's a bad, bad idea. The performance is terrible. The library went to fiber, has super fast internet, and they're not seeing it because they plugged it into super old networking gear that needs to be upgraded to get that, that speed they're paying for. So feel free to reach out with me um, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about the Medica grant a little bit at the end. Yeah. Um, where to buy? Uh, I like, I think, buying directly from Dell, HP, Lenovo at their websites is the safest way to do it. Um, you're going to get the latest tech. They have factory warranty and support. Um, they have cl good clearance sales mm -hmm. on their websites where you might be getting, you know, the previous generation, but they'll, they're, they got to mark rock bottom to get it cleared out so you can get some really good deals. Um, if you're a tech soup library, um, you can use your TechSoup account to get discounts with Dell and Lenovo. So those yep. are great ways to buy. Um, the libraries that I ran into that had bought new computers just to find out they weren't going to be able to run Windows 11, they came from Amazon. Amazon is a terrible place to buy a computer unless you know exactly what you're doing. Um, it's a lot of third-party resellers. And Amazon will say this is the Dell store or this is the HP store. It's not the Dell store. It's not the HP store. It's just all the HP computers for sale on Amazon or all the Dell computers for sale on Amazon. They tend to be third-party resellers that don't offer any support after the purchase. Or if you get one and it's bad, good luck getting hold of anybody and getting your money back. Um, they tend to be older overstock or refurbished PCs that are really, I've seen them and they're charging, it looks like it's a good deal because they're like $100 less than Dell. And, but you're getting a computer that's three or four generations old. They are not a deal. Um, just stay away from them. Um, now, I say that, but if you go in-store to Costco, Sam's, Walmart, Best Buy, if you're buying in-store off the shelf, they tend to be the latest and greatest stuff or maybe just one generation behind. So you can get some really good deals in the box stores if you're buying the computer there off the shelf. And if you're a library, you can get a tax sales tax free card. So when you buy your computers at the store, um, you take your card to the register. Hopefully you get a checkout person that knows what it is and you can get the sales tax knocked off right when you buy your um, computer. 
So something to be good there. Another thing you can do is state of Nebraska has negotiated prices with the big PC vendors for their products. Um, when I was in Sydney, um, my town had a purchasing rule that I had to have three quotes for anything I would buy. But if what I bought was off the state contract, I didn't have to get quotes. I could just buy it through the state contract at the state they negotiated trusted price. The state, yeah. And they had that for, it didn't matter if I was buying a computer, a road barrier, a dump truck. If I bought off the state contract, I didn't have to go run three quotes down. I could just say, I'm buying it on the state contract. I'm getting a Dell computer getting a really good price because the state's negotiated already on my behalf. It's a great way to buy your PCs. Um, you may have a local IT company that offers really good installation and support. Um, I see a lot of local uh, computer firms using a, a second, what I call a second tier manufacturer called DACTEC. Um, they use components from a company called ASUS. Um, I've had Asus computer gear. It's really good stuff. They tend to be very price competitive. Um, so if if you want to use your local PC vendor and they want to sell you DAC tech, um, I've been hands on with them. They seem to be pretty good PCs. Um, you may pay a little more to have that kind of hand holding. They show up and unbox it, install it, and set it all up for you. But you know if your library doesn't have the IT skill set to do it, or um, that may be a, a good avenue also for getting a decent computer. Not a fan of used computers. Um, I, I have some libraries, they have a good IT person that knows what they're doing and maybe finds an occasional deal on the used market. Um, most of the used computers you're buying, um, TechSoup has a whole line of used computers that I know are very popular. These tend to be PCs that have come off lease for big businesses. They're five years old already. Um, I don't think for what you're paying three, four hundred bucks, you're getting that good a deal for really old um, generation of tech. Um, if you are buying used, make sure it's already running Windows 11. Do not buy a used computer running Windows 10. You're probably running right, right up in the boat that it will not be upgradable. Again, if you have a TechSoup account, they have a whole line of used desktop and laptops. The vendor is, you know, all vetted and stuff, so it's a safe place to buy used computers. Um, but again, I'm not a fan of how old they are for the price. Uh, we talked about monitors. Amazon's a great source to buy cheap monitors. You can get a really nice 24-inch monitor for 100 bucks if you catch them when they're on sale and stuff. Hard to beat. Uh, Amazon's reviews are worth using. Uh, Walmart's reviews are worth using. Um, if you get a quote or you have something picked out at one of the, the big manufacturers websites, um, send me a copy of your quote. Um, HP and Dell and Lenovo all have an ability where you can spec a computer and then send the build to somebody to review. It's mm -hmm. kind of flaky. It, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but we can definitely try that too. Um, the other thing about paying for the computers, and Krista can jump in here, we do have the library improvement grant, which can be used for all different kinds of things at your library, but it can be used to pay for computers. And depending on the funds we have available, it can cover up to 75% of the mm -hmm. spend. Anything you want to add there, Chris? Yeah, um, we're actually working on um, putting together the grant program for the upcoming year for 2025. Um, my department, myself, um, in charge of the Infly Improvement Grants. So they should go, our plan is, there's nothing on the website right now, so don't go looking for it yet. We're working on updating all the forms and the web pages. but the plan is they will, um, the grants will open September 20th and then be due, I think, November 15th. And then you would have funding to use in 2025 for what, anything you're purchasing um, using library improvement grants. Um, and we do, for computers like this, we do, um, you know, Sherm is usually on the uh, review team, and we will make sure that you are getting something that ha will have Windows 11. We will not, um, we've done this before, um, not approved grants that did not confirm with us and show that, yes, the computers, we, we are, the money we are going to use from you will go to computers that will actually be able to be used and will have what we need for um, future. So we will make sure you confirm that with us. Um, so a quick run through on the recommended software for public computers. Um, Windows 11, that's the sweet spot. Um, if you're 
an Apple Macintosh fan, Sonoma is the current version. Um, Windows 11, which you'll see when you're out buying the sites, is they'll say the computer has Windows 11 Home or Windows 11 Pro. And that comes into play if you're buying what the manufacturer considers a consumer grade computer to use at home, it has Windows Home on it. If you're buying a business class computer that you would use in the office, it'll have Windows Pro. It doesn't really matter which one's on it. Um, home will probably be the cheaper computer and your best price. All the, the really the only difference between the two, it's Windows 11, but Pro offers a bunch of management features. So if I'm in a large company, my IT guys are able to do a lot of automated management and maintenance of the desktop computers throughout the company with the features that Windows 11 Pro provides. Um, for a small library that's got you know, a handful of public computers and a couple staff computers, it doesn't really matter which Windows um, shows up on it. it. Doesn't really matter at all. Um, Windows has the Edge browser built into it. Edge has a 5% market share. Um, Windows already has the Defender antivirus. There's no need to pay for antivirus software on public computers. Um, Defender's fine if you combine it with the Reboot Restore software. Those public computers are fully protected. There's no sense in paying. Um, for staff computers, you if you want to continue to purchase for antivirus, what the McAfee and the Norton and stuff do is not only do you get the antivirus protection, but you also get some web browsing protection and stuff like that. If you just, it will make you sleep better to have the extra um, pr protection you think you're getting from a purchase package than all by all means do for. Don't put the free versions on. All the free versions do is pop up and pop up and pop up and say, oh oh you gotta buy this you gotta upgrade that blah 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 they're just irritating especially the public computers you don't want the patron sitting down and having a computer pop up and say oh the McAfee's expired or you may have a virus upgrade to the full version to find out or it just will scare them so don't have that stuff on there just stick with the uh the defender that comes built into windows those updates are all take place with the windows update you don't have to do anything special for them um, I have been at libraries where um, they look at running an alternate OS so they can continue to use their old PCs. If you've got a Uber geek that's supporting your library and wants to maintain the Chrome Flex or the Linux on those computers, uh, knock yourself out. The problem you'll run into is they don't look anything like Windows. Um, so people come to the library, they'll sit down a computer in Linux and it's like, what the heck is this? Um, will it get the job done? Sure, but it just doesn't look like Windows. At least the Chrome OS Flex looks like Chrome. Now, the one issue I will point out with the Chrome OS Flex is it sounds like a really good idea, but even Google has a list of computers that um, are, not, are compatible with Chrome OS Flex, and they tend to not allow any of the old computers, um, just like Windows 11 is starting to do to not mm -hmm. run the Chrome OS Flex. So just be cautious of that. You know, you may put Chrome OS Flex on your old computers and think, hey, I just saved a bunch of money. And then six months down the road, Chrome goes, oh, yeah, we're not going to allow these old computers to run our operating system anymore. Um, Google Chrome browser, when I help libraries set up their computers, I like to put the Chrome browser on. They have 65% of the market share. When people come into your libraries to use your computers, the Chrome browser is, um, probably what they're accustomed to and like to see. Um, the search engine is way better than the uh, um, the one Microsoft has that's the default for Edge. Um, yeah, so Chrome, I think, is the way to go. Uh, I see a lot of libraries that use Mozilla. I think there's some of the ILS OPAC software that says Mozilla is still their preferred browser. So I see a lot on the staff computers, especially. They only have a 3% market share. So for the public computers, unless you know your your regulars, that's the browser they want. I just don't see any need to have it installed on the computers, especially when we talk about reboot restore software, it's one more thing you're gonna have to manually upgrade. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about a little bit this, so the bloatware. So when you buy a new computer, it comes with a bunch of pre-installed stuff and it tends to be a bunch of trial software. Um, security software is really notorious for this. McAfee, I think, is on I'm, almost every new computer I touch. 
um, possibly Norton. Um, there's a game company, Wild Tangent Games. I run into that a lot. So these this stuff's all preloaded, and it's a trial period. So it works for 30 days, 90 days, maybe even a year. Then it's going to start popping up and saying, "Hey, you know, your trial's up, or your trial's almost up, or you need this feature that's not in the trial version." Again, it's just a lot of annoying pop-ups and stuff. It burns a lot of processing power and performance out of your computer. So one of the first things I do when I'm helping a library set up new computers is I go out and I remove all that stuff. Um, Dell, Lenovo, HP, they have all their own client management software pre-installed on these computers. You know, if you're a big corporation with hundreds of computers to maintain and you want to use a, one of their proprietary management clients to do it, great but if, if i'm a library it's just software that we don't need on the computer you're going to get pop-ups from it too telling you to do this telling you to do that recommending you do this again we can remove it all and make that all go away uh, reboot restore software uh, the public computers i say this is a must-have uh, what reboot restore software does is when somebody uses a computer as soon as you reboot it any changes they made to it any documents they downloaded like bank statements, pay stubs, uh, Medicare forms, tax forms, gets automatically cleaned up and it's ready for the next person. Uh, just, I, I just think if you're gonna offer public computers to your patrons, this is something you have to have on there. So if somebody downloads something that's got their, you know, social security number, birth date, bank information on it, as soon as that computer is rebooted, it all goes away. It's not sitting there on the computer for somebody else to sit down and go, oh, I can see how much Joe makes at his job every two weeks. And I have his social security mm. number and all kinds of information because his pay stubs on there when he comes in and prints them out every week. So big fan of that. Uh, Adobe Acrobat Reader is their free reader. Um, if you've ever down had a person using the browser they download a PDF, it pops up in a browser tab, and they go to print it, and it prints all weird. The browsers still just don't seem to do a good job with the PDFs. They even sometimes don't display right. If you mm -hmm. have Acrobat Reader installed on the computer, you can download the form and use Acrobat. Um, Acrobat has extensions for Chrome and for Firefox, and I think for Edge that when you open a PDF, it's actually Adobe's Acrobat handing it all. It just resolves a lot of issues with PDFs I like to have on them. Um, I do have low libraries that offer Adobe Acrobat Pro and Creative Suite. Um, Adobe Acrobat Pro lets you edit and create PDF files. Um, Creative Suite is Photoshop and all that stuff. Um, we have people that come in and want to use it. There's the reason that Adobe stuff is problematic is you have to have an Adobe login account mm -hmm. to be able to access it and use it. And they require that you have a credit card on file. So like Photoshop, if you pick a piece of their art to use in your Photoshop creation, they can charge you for it. So libraries that have it, it takes a lot of forethought. Um, you can't get around the account login piece. But what I've seen, what I've done at my libraries where we have it is we buy a uh, one of the disposable credit cards and we put five or ten dollars on it and we use it to set up the adobe and then we use the five or ten dollars on something else so the card technically has zero dollars on it but it still recognizes a viable card by adobe and it allows us to have that software out there without having a credit card that somebody can go into the account and bring up and look at your credit card information um, on file with an adobe account Microsoft Office, it's still the standard. Um, it used to be for libraries, we pretty much, if we set up a public computer, we put Office on it. Um, again, it's gotten more expensive. Um, Office 365 produces a whole nother raft of issues for use on public computers. So I would say in this day and age, especially if your library has a big segregation between these are the computers in the children's area and these are the computers in the adult area, we probably don't need to spend the money to have Office on the kids' computers. Maybe we just want Office on the adult computers. Or maybe if my library has three public computers, we just have Office on one of the computers with a little note that says this computer has Office. So if somebody comes in needing to use Word or Excel or something, that's a PC we can direct them to. Um, I see a lot of libraries using LibreOffice, which is the open source free Office. Um, it's fine. Um, 
if your patrons aren't familiar with it, it may be a little harder to figure out, but it gets the job done. Um, Google Docs was really popular. Um, Google requires a Google account now to use it, which makes it again a little problematic for public computers. Um, I'm not sure it's worth sitting there with a person setting up a Google account just so they can get into Google Docs and do some stuff. Um, but that's an option too. Uh, my recommendation is the 221 standard office from TechSoup for 36 bucks. Um, mm -hmm. You can't beat the price. You can install it locally. Soup, yes. It doesn't take a Microsoft account to use like Office 365. Um, just really, really like it. It is a little bit bureaucratic, the process you have to go through between TechSoup and Microsoft to get it. If you don't want to put that much work into it, you could buy home and student off Amazon for 150 bucks. Do not get Office 365 for the public computers. Requires a Microsoft account. If you use the same Microsoft account on those computers and say on your staff computer, the OneDrive is shared because you're all logging in with the same Microsoft account. Mm. So if your staff computer is using that account and it's automatically storing files on OneDrive, if I log into one of your public computers and it logs me into that Microsoft account, I have access to all your files on OneDrive. So this gets back to a blurb I mentioned earlier when we're setting up new computers to the library, we want to set up a local account, like one called staff that's the administrator and one called patron that's the, the no password account that the people use when they come in and we avoid all those issues. And I am happy to do that. Um, when you, if your library gets new computers, you want my assistants to come out and set them up properly, I'm happy to make a visit and do that. Um, there is an offer that Microsoft has to nonprofits. This gets a little gray. Since your library is technically a city or town department, are you truly a nonprofit? Mm -hmm. But I've seen libraries that have a nonprofit library foundation use that as their, when they go in and create their Microsoft nonprofit account. And then you can get, I think it's, I've seen anywhere from 10 to 100 Office 365 licenses for free. Wow. So this might be a great way to get Office for your staff at no cost. You could set everybody up at the library with an Office 365 account, nonprofit. Like I said, it gets a little gray on whether it's legal or not, because are you a city department or are you truly a nonprofit? But I've seen libraries take advantage of this through their foundation, and it seems like it's worked really good for them, saved a bunch of money, and you get all the benefits of Office 365, being able to share files and stuff amongst your staff. Roblox, this is what all the kids come in after school and play. Um, Roblox is smart when they they set their software up, so you do not need administrator rights to install this on a computer at the library. It installs it into the local account. Um, so what you can do, if you've got a big group of kids that come in and play Roblox, what you can do is you can um, set up an, a login, Roblox login for the library, and you can use it to install and download um, Roblox updates. So when the kids come in after school, they don't have to do it. They can just fire up Roblox, log into their account, and start gaming. So it's really up to you how convenient you want to make it for the, um, the kids to come in and play. Um, filtering on the network, uh, this is something that um, I really encourage libraries to set up. We have a lot of libraries that can't afford or don't have the IT expertise to run firewalls. Mm -hmm. So this is a great first level kind of first mode of security that will help protect your um, your patrons and your staff. And what this does is basically the cybersecurity piece of it is if you go out into the web and you're going to a site that the security people have identified as a bad site, they're gonna try and do things to you they block that in the DNS request so you cannot get to the bad sites. Um, this is also used for the SIPA compliance for E-rate where we block um, adult um, sexually explicit websites for SIPA compliance. So if you were, we set this up and we're in this library, you're also eligible for E-rate. The library improvement grants are based on LSTA funds. They so are, yep. You would need to have this in place to be eligible for that also. Yes. And that is it. So thanks for sticking with me for an hour and a half of, of a pretty geeky conversation. Um, this is, most people did stay. I think we only had one person who logged off, so that's awesome. <laughs> so um, I'm here to help. Um, 
one thing I'll mention, so with the Medica grant, I've been traveling to libraries doing technology reviews. We look at the networking equipment, we look at the computers, um, and we can use those funds to pay for new networking equipment, and we can use those funds to pay for the Deep Freeze Reboot Restore software to protect your public computers. Um, the reason we're doing that is when Sam did the last survey, um, we added the question of whether your library was using Reboot Restore software. Only 50% of Nebraska's libraries were using it. That was very disappointing to me because back in the BTOP days, every BTOP computer that went out had Reboot Restore software. It's automatically on. included on the computers yeah. that you gave yeah, out. It yeah. looks like that has fallen off either because people are unaware of how important it is or they don't think they need to pay the money for it. Um, I think it's super important and well worth the cost and Medica was willing to step up for us and cover the cost and that will pay for the initial license and the first year's maintenance. So I really, really- And this is really, something I'll mention to the Medica grant. This is not something that you as libraries have to apply for for a grant. We at the commission received the grant to provide this to you. So we have the grant, you just reach out to Sherm and say, hey, I want to upgrade things network computers come help and then the yep. money helps them to do that in and case. i can do an on-site visit what's worked really successfully for us for computers are a long ways away they can send me photos of their networking equipment it's very easy to determine how old it is or we can do a zoom and you can share the desktop of your public computer with me i can check it out and say yeah this thing's super old um you should be getting in the budget to replace it because it can't do windows 11 or it is a Windows 11 computer and we can make sure it's set up right and has the Reboot Restore software on it that it should have. Mm -hmm. Awesome. We talked about Redbox shutting down. Um, the mm -hmm. other big news in E-Rate is hotspots are gonna be yes. eligible. Um, what I'm a big fan for the hotspots for is my library in Sydney, we had a bookmobile and we mm -hmm. had a hotspot on our bookmobile yeah. that we used to be able to access our OPAC ILS when the bookmobile was on the road. Um, it was also our backup internet connection. So if our mm -hmm. um, internet wired internet connection broke, we could set this hotspot up at our front desk, connect our computers to it and still have internet access and be in business. So big fan of the hotspots. They're mm -hmm. covered under E-rate now at your discount. Yes. So just something to think about there. Yep, that will be coming when E-Ray um, opens up for this upcoming year. Um, it is not, they haven't, op uh, usually the program starts off um, July 1st, the, um, yeah, the E-Ray, the first form, the 470 is available, but it is not available yet because they're working on adding in this um, new, it, they're all, they weren't on, as on top of it getting it official, uh, FCC making it official as quickly as we would hope. To. So they're still working it into the form, um, but hopefully soon it'll be available. And yes, those will be hotspots for your library or for you to lend out to your patrons as well. This came out of the um, emergency connectivity fund that was created due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Live, um, people needed internet at home, um, wherever they were. And so money was provided to lend out hotspots to people. And now it's gonna be part of the, a permanent part of the E-rate program after being part of that program that's no longer, um, that is shutting down. Yeah, one thing I like to do with hot, our hotspot at Sydney was um, when I would go to schools for the first of the school mm -hmm. year open houses, a lot of the schools Wi-Fi networks are fully secured. You can't connect your own laptop to the school's yeah. Wi-Fi but I could take the hotspot with me and I could do library card signups at the open house at the school at the start of the school year every year. So we would have a table set up and people could line up and we would make them library cards right on the spot. It was pretty cool. That's great. So you can take that everywhere. Go to the farmer's market, yep. go yep. anywhere. Yeah. Take the library on the road. <laughs> All right. Um, anything else, Sherm? So you've got your also, these are the previous Encompass live shows that um, Sherm has done. You can find them in our show archives. We've dug down into other specific issues. Anybody have any other last minute desperate questions that you want to ask of Sherm while you have him here? Uh, we got some thank yous coming through. Thanks for all the great information. Thanks for the um, recommendations for um, the software for library computers. Um, while I'm waiting to see if anyone does, I'm going to pull presenter control to my screen here. Again. 
do that. Cool. All right. So thank you so much. I'm so glad that you did this. Definitely. I know um, we struggled with getting libraries to keep their computers up to date. You mentioned the BTOP grant from um, a few years ago. And then before that, we had Gates Foundation grants. And we have had some libraries that have told us they're still using those computers. I was and just at a library that was still using their 13 year old BTOP computers. Yeah. I mean, on Windows 10. Going. They only had four gigabits of RAM. They were slower than heck. It was yeah. click and wait, click and wait, click and wait, but they were still using them. And they just didn't know that this, this isn't how it's supposed to be. <laughs> you need sustainability. Well, and we did have that as part of the BTOP program, which is really, it makes me sad that part of that was we did do training and workshops on sustainability. This isn't a one shot thing. Yeah. We're giving you computers and then you you're done. The, the you have to constantly be up constantly be regularly looking at them and upgrading them. Yeah. Well, um, the bad thing is this is a library that I visited because of the Medica grant. We upgraded their network because they weren't getting the internet speed mm -hmm. they were supposed to be getting from their fiber because they had plugged it into a really old network switch and exactly. had a really old Wi-Fi router. And so in the process of, I was on site, we upgraded all that, added a UPS to their network equipment. And then I went to look at their public computers and it's like, why do we have fast internet? It's literally this thing is like click and wait, click and wait, click and wait, click and wait. Mm -hmm. they, they were long overdue uh, yeah. for replacement. Um, well, it's good that I'm glad we've got this special grant to help them out with it and you to also hold their hands through it. Um, that we got some other comments. So thank you so much. Thanks both of you. I'm sure we'll be in touch. So you're going to be yep. hearing from like people. Said, if you um, get a quote or you're out at the Dell site and we want to maybe do a Zoom and I hope you pick something out, we can definitely do that. Another thank you for the information. Helps to know what we need to look for and how to go about it. We'll look forward to working with you. Yeah, like I said, it, it's a lot of moving parts and I am happy to either, you know, through a phone, Zoom, or you know review a quote happy to help out and make mm -hmm. sure we're getting the most bang for our buck yeah absolutely please do everyone all right so i think we will wrap it up for today's show uh thanks again sherm thanks everyone for being here um if you do go to whatever is your search engine of choice and look up encompass live you'll find our main page here's our upcoming shows um but i was going to mention our archive the link to our archive shows is right underneath our um upcoming shows and um most recent one in the top today's recording and a link to the slides will be here should be by the end of the day tomorrow at the latest um everyone who attended today's show and registered will get today's show get an email from me we also push out onto our social media we have a facebook page for encompass live if you like use facebook give us a like over there so we do reminders about logging into the show and then we also announce when the recordings are available we also post onto the Library Commission's um, YouTube channel, not YouTube, sorry, Twitter account, Twitter, Twitter and Instagram. We use NCUP Live, a little hashtag abbreviation for the show, so you can follow us on all the social medias. Um, let me see if I can do, if I search for sure, we'll come up with, yeah, here are all the presentations that he has done and things he did before he worked for us. But <laughs> Wi-Fi in the library, internet filtering, secure computers. Um, so these are some of the recent shows that he did if you want to find just his. Um, you can search our full show archives or just most recent 12 months if you want something very current. That is because this is our full show archives. I'm not gonna scroll all the way down because this is obviously you can see a huge list. Um, these are our full show archives going all the way back to 2009, which is when Encompass Live first premiered. So we're in our 16th year of the show and we have all of our show recordings here. Um, so if you are watching any old show, anything in our archives, just pay attention to the original broadcast date. Uh, many of the shows will be fine to watch, uh, good, useful information, stand the test of time, but some things will become old and outdated. Resources may have changed drastically or um, not exist anymore. Links might be broken. Uh, people will work at different places and when they first uh, presented for us. Um, but as long as we have a place to host all of these, which right now is the Library Commission's YouTube channel, we will always keep the show, all of these recordings out there. It's something libraries do, we keep things for historical purposes often, and um, we will keep them all out there for you. So just always pay attention to that broadcast date. It's on the original broadcast date. It's on all of our show archives. Um, 
get back to our main page here. All right. And I think that's everything. All right. So that wraps it up for today. Um, I hope you all join us on next week's show. It is the last Wednesday of the month, which means it is Pretty Sweet Tech Day. Um, we obviously do tech related shows other times like today but always the last wednesday of the month amanda sweet our technology innovation librarian comes on the show and talks about something techie related sherm's joined her a few times um but next week she's gonna talk about something very fun uh, making how to make a magic butterfly wand so kind of like you know, using an rc cars and stuff to do that so some programming maybe uh looks like it'll be a lot of fun a fun uh activity for all of us to learn how to do so please do sign up for that show and any of our other shows we have here um, coming up. We've got our September calendars dates in. We've got we started working on dates in October. Um, so just keep an eye on here for when we are at filling in all the other dates. Uh, note, we are taking a week off. We always take off um, the week of our Nebraska Library Association Conference. So you'll notice that's on here already. October, um, the week of October 9th is the state's, our annual um, state library conference. We will be off that week. All right, thank you everybody. Thank you, Sherm, and hopefully we'll see you all on a future episode of Encompass Live. Yep, bye-bye everybody. Bye-bye.